All right. Good morning, everyone. I have 901. So we are going to get started and we are in for an incredible treat today. For those who don't know Dr. Swinton, it is incredible that he is here presenting with us. We are just incredibly blessed today to be able to hear from a great scholar who has done wonderful work. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to our chair of the building, our chair of our board of adult education, Jim Proust, who has studied with Dr. Swinton. And so that is what gave us this connection to invite him to be with us. So Jim, could you tell us a little bit more about our speaker today? I certainly could. I, uh, as, uh, as Jacob said, I uh, studied with John. I first met him in the fall of 2005, I believe it was when I, first arrived in, in Aberdeen early that morning and uh, went and walked to the university from my hotel and knocked on his door and there he was smiling and wondering, having wondered where I was. Um, but uh, John Swinton is a professor of practical theology and pastoral care at the University of Aberdeen. He is the founder of Aberdeen Center for Spirituality, Health, and Disability. Prior to entering academia, he was a uh, mental health nurse dealing with uh, people with mental health issues and what in Scotland are called learning disabilities, but we would call intellectual disabilities. And he was also a mental health chaplain. He has authored numerous books, including uh, in 2016, was awarded the Michael Ramsey Award by, I believe, the Archbishop of Canterbury for his book entitled Dementia, Living in the Memories of God. And so um, I've read, gotten the privilege to spend quite a bit of time with both John and his family and study under him. And his most recent book, which just came out a few months ago, is entitled Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges. And um, in particular, since we as a congregation are working on becoming a wise congregation and, and welcoming and inclusive to people with mental health challenges, I thought it was a yeah, it was particularly apt topic that John would be able to come and, and speak to us. And so without further ado, John, the floor is yours. Oh. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, that's a very kind introduction. And it's really nice to, to meet you all, even though you're thousands of miles away. It's, it's, a, it's just a strange way to communicate. Um, but it's good to be here. And what I want to do tonight, or for you this morning, is um, just give you a sense of some of the things that I've been thinking about in relation to mental health recently. And uh, Jim mentioned the, the, the book that came out last year. And I, I wanted just to focus on some of the things that emerged from, from that book. So my, my background is, uh, as Jim says, is in mental health nursing. And I worked in hospital chaplaincy for a while in mental health care. Um, and so for most of my formative years, I've been with people who see the world differently. And when you hang around with people that see the world differently, you start to see things differently yourself. Uh, and that's certainly the case when it comes to mental health issues. Um, but one of the things that always struck me was that uh, it was never very clear to me what faith uh, and theology had to offer to the lives of people with mental health challenges. And when I read through the kind of things that had been written, what tends to happen was that people will uh, get, go to psychiatry or psychology to get a diagnosis and then think that that's, they understand what it is and then try to understand what the pastoral care is or what the theological issues are from there. Um, and that's all very well because I'm, I'm a great fan of psychiatry and psychology, they're very important. But the problem is that when somebody gives their story to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, the psychiatrist and the psychologist then filters their experiences, their stories, what they've been going through, through the particular theoretical frameworks and then comes up with a diagnosis and then treats the person accordingly. 
all about that, which is good because medication is good, treatment is good, therapy is good. But the problem is that sometimes, maybe very all, maybe all the time, the person's original story, that what meant what it meant for them as individuals, as unique individuals, gets lost in the midst of that. And so I was always really interested in what happens if we put to one side the assumptions that we have about diagnosis, about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, whatever it is, and really listen to the individual uh, as a person and try not to be prejudiced, try to listen to their experiences and see what happens. And so I spent two or three years just doing that, just talking with the Christians who were living with severe mental health challenges. So people with schizophrenia, people with bipolar disorder, and people with major depression, trying to get behind the diagnosis and trying to get to that place where you could understand the story. And when you understand the story, you can see what, what uh, uh, the significance of faith in the midst of that. And when you see the significance of faith, faith, then it becomes possible for the church to make a, a useful, an original and complementary contribution to mental health, mental health care. So that's the background to what I want to talk to you about. Now, I've, I have a, I have a, a slide presentation here, which I may be able to share with you. So uh, bear with me if I don't, but I think I should be able to do this. Okay, let me just... Uh, All right, there we go. Good, <laughs> give myself a gold star. Right, so this is where we are. So the first thing I want us to think about is what is mental health? Because very often when we're thinking about mental health, we think first of all about psychiatry, psychology, and we think secondly, or maybe at the same time, about problems. And so we assume that mental health is just related to issues of illness or challenge or what it is. But one of the interesting things is that the Bible doesn't have a word for health in the way that we use it within our kind of biomedical culture. Very often we think health is the absence of illness. And so you're either ill or you're, you're unwell. And then to, to be healed is to move from that state of being unwell or ill to, uh, to health. But the Bible doesn't have that word within it. The closest word that the Bible has uh, is shalom. Uh, and shalom, of course, means peace, but it's a much deeper meaning than that. The core meaning of the word shalom is justice, righteousness, holiness, right relationship with God. And so to experience God's shalom is first of all, it's a gift. It's something that God gives to us. And secondly, it's not to do with our mental, physical, uh, our mental or physical state. It's to do with our relationship with God. So you can be really, really ill. You could be at the end of your life and you could be much more healthy than an athlete who has no relationship with God, who has no sense of, of who they are in the presence of God. So righteousness, holiness, right relationship. That's the way scripture seems to explain health. And that's really, really important because one of the things with certain forms of mental health challenge is that they're not gonna get better. People are not going to get better. They're going to have to live well with that condition for the whole of their lives. Uh, and with a standard model of health, that means somebody's going to be ill forever. And you're always going to be ill. But the biblical model of health that I want you to think about says that no matter what you're going through, even in your wildest storms, you can be healthy. And that the task of the church is not simply to eradicate symptoms. It's actually to enable a person to remain uh, engage with God, even in the midst of the difficulties that they are experiencing. So let's put it like this. So mental health is not the absence of anything. You might think it's the absence of symptoms, the absence of distress, but it's not. It's the presence of God. And the, 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 that sense that people feel connected to God, even though the circumstances are very, very difficult. So mental health is not an ideal, a concept or a goal, it's a relationship. To be healthy is to be in relationship with God. So mental health is a, a theological concept rather than just a psychological or a, or a social, a, a, a psychiatric concept. 
And of course, the presence of God is revealed through human relationships. So when you're going through the traumas and difficulties of mental health, how do you find healing? Or you find healing in other people who help you, who hold you in that space where you can find God, even though God seems far, far away at particular moments of time. And that's important, really, when we think about the, the issue of healing. Very often we think of healing as, you know, let's get rid of this horrible thing, let's get rid of this illness, let's get rid of this, this, this difficulty. But actually healing, in this sense, is connection. It's connection with Jesus. And so you can see, actually, you can see that very often in, in, the, in the gospel narratives. The gospel narratives of healing are always about Jesus. We sometimes think that about the healing, but they're always about Jesus. And if you think, for example, of the, um, the woman who's hit, healed of a discharge of blood. So she touches Jesus' cloak and she's healed in a sense that she's cured. But at the end of her encounter, when she recognizes who Jesus is, Jesus says, go, your faith has, made, has healed you. So the healing actually came uh, in its fullness when she came to know who Jesus was and was able to hold on to that. So getting that difference between curing and healing is really helpful because it means that even though somebody's going to live with a mental health challenge all their lives, they can still experience that healing presence as all of us can. And so you, you might have noticed that I'm not talking about um, mental illness. It's not because uh, I, I'm against medicine. It's not because I'm against psychiatry. I just think mental health challenges is a better way of expressing things because it's positive. It means you're moving towards health. It means you're moving towards something constructive. Whereas illness means that you're kind of not well and, and you, you need to find a, a doctor. Challenge means that all of us together can help us to move on and to reconstruct our stories. Because basically, mental health challenges, they, they change your stories, they change the stories of our lives, and we, we think things differently about ourselves and about the world. So let me, let me give you an, a, a, an example of the way that works, the way that mental health challenges disrupt our stories. One of the, the gentlemen in the study that I was involved with, his name was Alan, uh, Alan Walker. Um, and he's, he's a good guy, I'd known him for a long time. And he, was, he, lives with, he lived with schizophrenia. Uh, and he told me a, a really interesting story about the day that he discovered that he had schizophrenia. He said, I'd been having lots of strange experiences and I had lots of, I was seeing things, I was hearing voices, I was all sorts of things. And I went to the psychiatrist and we, we talked. And eventually the psychiatrist told me that he had, that I had schizophrenia, he said. And he said, I was really disappointed. I, I thought it was really interesting. He said, I was really disappointed because I felt that my life was over. And I thought that was interesting that you get a diagnosis that suddenly disappoints you and you feel that your life is over because if you get a diagnosis of uh, influenza you don't feel your life is over in that sense something different happens with a mental health diagnosis and he was saying he said to me i was going back home on on the uh, uh bus and there was a lady on the bus and she, she i'd known her for, for many many years we share many journeys and i sat down beside her and I spoke to her and I told her that the psychiatrist had just told me uh, I had schizophrenia. And she got up and walked off the bus and she hasn't talked to me that since that day, he said. Uh, and he was devastated by this, just because he had this diagnosis. So he went home and he told his mum the story. And he told his mum how hopeless he was. And his mum said to him, well, Alan, yes, you have schizophrenia. But you're not a schizophrenic, you're Alan, and I love you. And he said, that was the moment when I began to find healing in the midst of my condition. And that strikes me as a lovely model for what the church should be doing. We should be saying, yeah, you have that mental health challenge. Yeah, it's difficult, but you're, I know your name, and I love you. And so the beginning point for mental health uh, ministry it's to know people's names. Don't just know the diagnosis, know their names and learn how to love them. 
Because sitting at the heart of the problems that Alan experiences is the idea of stigma. The stigma happens when you reduce a person to one part of them. You take a whole person and you reduce it to simply one small part. And mental health diagnoses sometimes do that. They take away the person as a person and say, you're, you're, you're a schizophrenic or you're a depressive or you're a whatever you are. And stigma is devastating because it's, it shrinks your horizon, it shrinks your world. The second thing that we can do is move beyond stigma towards people. And remember, diagnoses are probably helpful for mental health professionals. They're maybe not so helpful for us. Our task is to find people and to give them back their names in the name of Jesus in that sense. Hello, my name is not schizophrenia. My name is Alan. Now, stigma works itself out in a lot of ways, but one of the ways it works itself out is in spiritual stigma. I'll give you an example again from this study. Spiritual stigma is when you take your faith tradition and you try to explain somebody's condition and, ex and explaining them to, to the condition, you actually make things much, much worse. So Glenda, she, uh, this, is, this is quite interesting. She says she lives with bipolar disorder and she says, I've had some really bad experiences. Once when I was in the emergency room, I felt so depressed. I was seriously thinking about killing myself. I asked for a chaplain and I said to him, could I be, is it possible that I'm possessed by the devil? And he was like, I really don't know. Which was like kind of a horrible thing to say to, for him to say. I just thought maybe he should have said no, but I don't know, like, I guess the answer was maybe, but that was pretty negative. Not the kind of truth I wanted to hear. So you can see the problem there. The chaplain, rather than thinking about the whole of our situation there, goes for, or at least doesn't discredit a, a, an explanation that is clearly going to be distressing for her. And very often we can do that. We can draw things from our tradition. We say, well, you're like this because you don't have enough faith, or you're like this because you, you're possessed by the devil. But what she's saying is, uh, or what she reminds us is, what must it be like when you're going through really difficult experiences and the people that claim to love you think you're the devil. It's a very unusual way for Christians to behave. Um, for her, it, 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 her real problem, she said, I've decided that if this happens again, and it happened to her a lot of times, the people have said things like that to her, and I'm sure it will, especially if I get psychotic, religious and depressed, that I won't talk to anyone religious, because I guess you guys, and I'm including you, John Swinton, as a religious person, Feel the need to honestly answer the questions. I don't know how many people how people are trained to be chaplains with people in mental distress, but that experience of that person was just terrible. Even if you thought that that was not the right thing to say, you just have to be really careful not to invalidate people's experiences. I mean, if someone was suicidal and they think they're possessed by the devil, it might be best not to reinforce that, even if you believe it. You just could just say, well, don't worry about that you're going to be fine. And there's something really important about that, that we should be careful not to stigmatize people by too quickly going to answers within a tradition that feel as if they kind of help us to explain the unexplainable, but actually can be quite dangerous for other people. And so let's think for a moment about the issue of healing. Now bear in mind what I'm saying about health as shalom and healing as reconnection and coming together around the person of Jesus. Um, there's four, four dimensions of healing that I want us to speak about. Obviously, there's a, there's a supernatural dimension of healing, which I'm not going to speak about, but I'm, I'm very open to that. And we can discuss that if you, if you want. Um, but these are, these are aspects of healing that we might not normally think about. The first one is, is scriptural healing. The way in which we use scripture is intended to enable us to love one another more. You know, Paul talks about that, it's a scripture is great for teaching, for preaching and for, for bringing us together in that sense. Sometimes when we encounter mental health challenges, um, scripture can be really difficult. So when you have passed, when you're feeling alienated from God, when you're feeling in that dark, deep, depressive state, sometimes the way in which we use scripture can be difficult for us in a number of different ways. You know, when we read the Psalms of Lament, for example, in Psalm 88, 
darkness is my only companion. If you're reading that while you're uh, in the midst of depression, then that will be difficult for you. Um, and certainly in the study that, uh, that I did, that idea of darkness and abandonment from God was central to a number of people, particularly people living with depression, but also people living with other conditions. A sense that somehow God has abandoned them. Now, some of the participants in the study had gone to their congregation and expressed this sense of emptiness. And the response from the congregation had been, well, if you had a little bit more faith, then uh, these things wouldn't happen. And that was deeply troublesome for people. And it made me think, it made me wonder about God and wonder about how we use our tradition in our teaching and in our preaching. Because one of the interesting things that you may or may not have noticed before is that in scripture, God frequently seems to hide himself or not to be there for whatever reason. Isaiah 45, 15 to 17, said, Isaiah says, truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the saviour. Isaiah 52, 9, 1952, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, these two passages speak in different ways about the fact that God's not available. The first one is mysterious, that God just somehow hides himself. The second one indicates that sometimes it's the things that we do that make, it make God seem to be not with us. But either way we want to, whatever way we want to interpret that, within our tradition, there is a sense of the absence of God, which is not explained simply by our faithlessness, but actually is mysterious. And you can see that uh, at the heart of our tradition is the cross. And at the heart of the cross is that cry by Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And no answer comes. And so it's like, it's a, it's a fascinating passage that no answer comes. And the change in language between Jesus earlier in his life when he talks about Abba, Father, the warmth. And then here it's God at a distance in the midst of the, the, his suffering. He can't find God in that way. Now, the interesting thing there for us is that at the heart of our tradition, and actually at the heart of the gospel, is that mysterious absence of God that happens sometimes and sometimes doesn't, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a common experience. And so when we experience the absence of God because of our mental health challenges or in the midst of our mental health challenges, it's not unusual. It's part of our tradition. The problem is that very often we don't teach that part of our tradition. And we forget that when the psalmist says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that that's a prayer. It's part of the liturgy. The articulation of that sense of abandonment, uh, even though clearly uh, Jesus wasn't abandoned because God can't abandon himself. But that feeling is, is, is something that's part of a tradition. So we need to think about that when we're thinking about scripture, when we're thinking about preaching, that we preach the wholeness of our spirituality and not just these joyous moments that really bolster us, but actually these undercurrents that are difficult but profoundly important in terms of the healing power of scripture. So let me just illustrate that with a, a couple of um, extracts from, from this project. One woman who was really interesting, she, she uh, was a charismatic evangelical Christian um, uh, who had really significant enduring depression. And she was talking here about worship. This is what she says. She said, but it was also difficult because our church is charismatic evangelical. And so there's a lot of happy clappiness, which when we are depressed and crying is just awful. Yeah. But I mean, Sunday and churches were excruciating. Just turn up, worship, listen to the preacher and then run away or cry during the ministry time. Just dealing with people was so overwhelming. But then she says this is, this is interesting. But thankfully, our worship leader is. He's a guy who really believes in let's have worship, which talks about how rotten life can be, which I really like. And so while there's happy clappiness, uh, while there was this happy clappiness, he'll often be a Sunday of uh, lament where we'll all just wail and go, life is awful. 
which really freed me up. It was incredibly helpful. And I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the majority of the Psalms, which Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks us about the Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, the majority of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. God gives us a language to articulate our suffering, our brokenness, our lostness, but in the context of worship. And the beautiful thing about lament is that you get that big explosion of anger and frustration and joylessness. And then suddenly in the middle of the lament psalm, something changes. Suddenly the, the, the psalmist recognizes God's has said, God's unending love, and then goes on to worship. And so there's space within our liturgy for honesty in the midst of pain and suffering that leads to worship and a certain form of healing. So she continues, uh, and this is, this is interesting. She said, but then saying that, actually, it was also really helpful to be in a congregation of people who are still worshiping, worshiping God, still being happy clappy, still being hopeful when I was just like this, I just can't do this. Because it meant they were like, well, you can't do it, but we can do it for you. Which I really I just really appreciated. People would be standing alongside me in prayer, like during the worship time, they'd have a hand on my shoulder while they were just fully singing, worshiping and rejoicing. And I was just a wreck crying, but I found that incredibly profound because it's that sense of someone's willing to be alongside me. And yet they were not forgetting the truth that I couldn't grab at that moment in time. So if you can imagine that the body of Christ, Jesus' body, and within that, there are broken people who need to articulate the sadness. But these broken people also need people who are joyful, who are happy, who are, who are able to see the things that they can't see. And so as we come together as a worshiping body, then everybody can participate in safety and openness in that way. Uh, and she found that really important. And the only way that she was able to do that is because her congregation took lamentation seriously. And as soon as that happened, as soon as sadness become part of this, this, this service, the possibility of joyfulness accompanied it. So I'm, I'm coming to the end of what I, what I want to say to you, and we can maybe talk for a little while, but there's a couple of, couple of more things that I want us to think about. Um, one woman I spoke to said this, and this is worth thinking about in relation to, you know, preaching and teaching uh, and community building. She said, my colleague developed an entire liturgy for people with depression. The church had never identified mental health directly, but because he named the fact that many people in the church live with depression, he brought out the issues. He wrote a beautiful service using scripture, candles, anointing with oil, prayers that he wrote specifically for people with depression. And I think that th things like that go a long way to make, making a congregate people with mental health, mental illness, uh, feel welcome within a congregation. So allowing our liturgy to, uh, to embrace the whole of God's people is something, it's a challenge, but it's something that's deeply healing and deeply important. So one last example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a bit and you can, you can ask me whatever you want. We can talk about whatever you want. But I wanted to talk to you about Alice, because Alice is interesting. Alice uh, uh, has lived with schizophrenia. And she, uh, for most of her early life, had had terrible voices. She had voices that tell her to do horrible, horrible things, voices that would tell her to, to, she was worthless, she was useless, she was just had a really difficult time. And then when she was in her early 20s, uh, all her voices stopped. Now, she puts it down to a group of women who were praying for her, who prayed for her over time, uh, and who weren't, weren't praying for her healing, just praying for her. But she was healed in that sense. It just, it just disappeared from her. So she put it down as supernatural healing. Her psychiatrist put it down to a misdiagnosis and felt there was something, uh, uh, something clinical that was going on in there. Somewhere between these two things is the truth. But this is what, what, what the point I want you to think about. She said to me, Alice said to me, you know, um, one of the first things that happened to me, one of the first experiences I had when my voices went away was I felt really lonely. 
because I'd been so used to having this cacophony of voices all around me, and suddenly I was on my own, and nobody had wanted to be my friend before that, so I really felt alone and isolated. And very often people with, with mental health challenges will say that, it's a medication will take your symptoms down, but sometimes actually it leaves you lonely. Um, but she said something else. She said, I was lonely, uh, not just because I kind of felt on my own in that sense, but because I'd lost something. Because one of the things that people don't always notice is that when somebody is hearing voices, uh, some of the voices are very difficult, but some of the voices are very supportive. Uh, and for her, there was one voice that had been, always been very supportive. And she had, she had named it uh, Margaret, I think, I can't remember. Really. But she had named it anyway. And she said, when I no longer had my voices, I lost my friend. And so she had this strange situation where she had to grieve over losing somebody that was important to her, um, but not being able to tell anybody else, because if she told anybody else, she'd, she'd think that they'd think her, her psychosis had come back. But my point is that voices are meaningful. And voices are, are unusual. I, mean, I don't know if you, you've ever, I don't know if you know this, but something like, uh, up to 18% of the population, of the non-psychiatric population hear voices. People hear voices all the time. They only become prob problematic when they cause somebody distress. So voice hearing at one level, you think, oh, that's something that's really unusual and strange and over there. It's not, it's very mainstream. People hear voices all the time. The key is whether or not they cause distress. And my point really is that you're only going to know what's happening with somebody like Alice, what her voices mean, what, her, uh, what, what kind of way she's processing the world if you offer her friendship. Christ-like friendship. Jesus comes into the world, offers the tax collectors, the sinners, the rejected, the marginalized friendship. Indeed, he calls friendship in John's gospel. He says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. So friendship becomes discipleship. So when we enter into friendship, into discipleship with people who are going through these really unusual experiences, A, we're faithful to the friendship that God has given to us, and B, we'll actually be able to see things very, very differently. We'll be able to see new things, we'll be able to understand Alice's strange loneliness, but we'll understand things in a way that doesn't stigmatize people and opens up people to meaningful relationships. Because ultimately, God is love and love is listening. Because in order for us to love, we need to listen. And we need to listen with care, with attentiveness, and with, uh, with love. So that's all I want to say to you, just to give you a, a general sense about, uh, about the kind of ways in which uh, I've been thinking about these things and the relevance or potential relevance for uh, your own congregation or for any congregation who really, uh, I was going to say who really wants to have a mental health ministry, but I can't understand a, a church that wouldn't want to have a mental health ministry because you don't, don't, really, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> so, but I, I think taking a slightly different angle and thinking this is not just charitable, it's not just pastoral care, it's actually discipleship, then you, you begin to see things uh, in a slightly different way. Oh, absolutely incredible, Dr. Swinton. Thank you. That was such a clear presentation and powerful. And haven't, yeah, we're getting lots of digital round of applause. Thank you for that. Just haven't heard it expressed in such um, clear terms. So thank you for your presentation. We have time for questions. So feel free to put them in the chat. Unmute yourself if you want to jump in and ask something. I'll jump in. Okay, and then I saw Karen unmute as well. So go ahead, Jim. And then Karen. Um, thank you for that. Well organized and having probably been the only person here who's actually gone through your book, I'll maybe ask you to drill down on a couple details, if you wouldn't mind. Um, one of which I found interesting when you talked about depression is you talked about depression as a disturbance of joy rather than a lack of happiness and as an anti-feeling. Would you talk about that a little more? And Yes, sometimes we, 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 we equate joy with happiness. 
And so if, if we think, you know, count it all joy means let's really be very happy. But when you look at the way that the, the, the word joy is used in the New Testament, uh, it's always accompanied by suffering. It's, it's a way of being with Jesus in good times, in bad times, and counting all of these things as joy, rather than simply being, you know, uh, seeking after happiness. So happiness is an emotion. It's a, it comes and it goes. But joy, that is our, our, um, our ongoing relationship with Jesus through good and bad things, is something that sustains us in that way. So when we're seeking after joy, it doesn't mean we're seeking after happiness. It means we're seeking after, I mean, it, it means we're uh, engaged in a particular form of relationship that includes happiness, but it's not defined by it. And so uh, in relation to depression, that means that, that you know, people oftentimes think about uh, depression as just a lack of happiness, but actually it's, it's a lack of joy very often because you, you simply feel that relationship with Jesus tends uh, uh, difficult and, and fragmented or can be. Um, so one of the interesting things that people said to me was um, that happiness and depression are not the same thing. So sometimes we think that depression is you go from happiness to unhappiness and then you would try to get back to happiness. But they, the people were saying to me that like depression is, is something that happens to you. It's a deep, dark, existential crisis, which you just, you just completely lose everything. And happiness is over here. And the two run along parallels, but they're not the same thing. And one guy said to me, look, actually I long for, for, for happiness. Um, sorry, I, I long for, for sadness because at least when I'm sad about something, uh, then I, I can kind of um, understand what the origins of it is. Mm -hmm. The problem with yeah, depression is it just happens and I, I have no understanding of it. So that, that's kind of what I was pushing into there. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to jump in with a question about the woman who was suicidal and asked whether she was possessed by the devil and was not pleased with the answer maybe and suggested instead that she would have preferred to be told everything is gonna be all right. That kind of answer has always seemed to me to be too superficial and not helpful. So I'm wondering if you could suggest for us what a what a better theologically based response would be to someone asking that kind of question. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends on the circumstances, but there's two, two things I would say. For that particular woman, she, she lives with um, bipolar disorder. Uh, and bipolar disorder is, is one of the few conditions that pretty clearly biomedical, biochemical. So it's, it's, it's a chemical imbalance around lithium. And so in that situation, a chaplain should have gone there first rather than going to the, the demonic, which it would, or, or, you know, but the fact that he didn't do that, like redirect her to the, the fact that yes, medication can help you here. Uh, uh, and there is hope for you. And if, you know, there, are, there are ways in which we can manage your condition. That would have been helpful, um, but to 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 insinuate something beyond that uh, was unhelpful. But the second thing is, and it's very common for people to do that, uh, something similar to that. So somebody hears voices and you say, "Well, it must be the demonic." But I, I just I, I, I challenge anybody that thinks that way to think wh why it is that you would uh, use the language of evil and the demonic and some of the most vulnerable people within society who are going through some of the most awful experiences and not use it in relation to politicians and bankers and lawyers. That space where Paul says the powers really do function. Uh, and so I think that there's a challenge for us there uh, if, if we want to, to, to use that kind of language as to who and why. Can I say something about that? Um, the problem with the, the, the I'm Bob Salinger, I'm a retired psychiatrist. Hi, so Bob. The problem with the example and the response is that it's just the tip of the iceberg. And we don't know what's up with this woman. We don't know if her medications are out of balance. We don't know if she's having an episode. We don't know if she has a demon. 
we, we need to know her. We need to listen to her. Right. <clears throat> we need to find out what this all means. We need to find out the social context. We need to find out what her pastor and her church have told her about demons. There's just a vast amount of material that we would need to know to understand. My initial response to that from a superficial point of view would be to say, God is stronger than the devil. But let's get to know you. We, there, there's just so many things here. And the church coming alongside and having a place of love and support and understanding would really help a person like this. Yeah. So no, I, think I could that, talk that, about this for two hours, but I'm going to stop. No, 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 I'd like to hear you talk about what you're I, 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 You're absolutely right. But I mean, that, that's the key point. So superficial answers are just unhelpful. Um, but it's taking the time to get to know somebody over time. In that case, a chaplain should have had that time. But, but I guess we as, as, as church communities need to find that time because that's a time where we can, exactly a time of discernment where we can work out uh, things in precisely the way you're talking about. So that's a great point. Um, I'm going to, to add, we had a personal example of this come up um, this uh, just in the last couple of days of someone we knew from where we lived in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, she is a part of our congregation. We had a long, many year um, relationship with her. She's very alone, has a lot of things going on. And so Bob and I were having a conversation. She left a voicemail and I'm just speaking to how we come alongside people because it's, it's easy in the sense to watch a presentation and not our heads. And here we, Bob's who he was, we were who we were with this woman and we're struggling with how are we going to respond to this woman 2000 miles away? What can we do? And to be honest, I have to say, I'm having a hard time wanting to call her back. It's your turn. Um, and I'm being very honest in this. So I think that's where I go to in how we step into these um, places of coming alongside people. I was very touched by the example you gave of the, the woman in the charismatic situation where people reached out to her in the midst Absolutely. of their, that to me was real live um, loving. That was real life Christ coming through that congregation yeah. to be with her and not shine away from her. So it, it's just, I'm just sharing that um, example. You've touched, your presentation has touched deeply. Um, I loved your slide of my name is not schizophrenia. <laughs> and I, it's, we just had that real live situation this week that I said, I don't want to do this right now, and, and it's I, we need to we have we need to respond and all of that. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. I I, I yeah. Uh, what one of the things that, <clears throat> that's, I mean, these are great points. One of the things that troubles me, and it troubles me when I write a book like this book, particular book, is that people do write to you for advice, and people do reach out to you, uh, uh, but unfortunately, these people are thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away but you still have the same responsibility or I feel I still have the same responsibility to do the best I can even at a distance to help them to work through whatever issue it is that uh, I am and I'm sure I fail miserably but I, I guess my miserable failure is probably better than nothing in, in relation to what, you know, what many people have in terms of the, the, the freedom to speak about certain things. So I, I empathize. Yeah. Um, thanks, Reggie. I'm going to jump in with a question from the chat. And then I think, Peggy, I saw you about to unmute. OK. Um, but just I want to name Jane. Thanks for being honest, because I think it's important as we engage in mental health ministry that we don't have this dichotomy of there are people with mental health challenges over here, and then there are people without mental health challenges over here because so many of us deal with mental health challenges at some point in our life. It's not an on off switch. It's not an us versus them. And also um, as we come alongside each other, it's difficult for all of us. If we're trying to come alongside someone with a mental health challenge, sometimes it's not easy. Uh, 
and to be in community with each other is also to name our difficulties and pain. So I really like that. Um, Dr. Swinton, the question in the chat is, what are some helpful scriptures for reference for those that struggle with depression, addiction, PTSD, childhood trauma, or other difficult psychological conditions? And how should we interpret those scriptures? Thanks, Barbaras, for that question. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, these, these are all really difficult, uh, real different con conditions or experiences, uh, all of which should have different scriptures. But there is a, a, a new, and I'll not pass, I'm not bypassing, but there is a new book that just came out called The Bible and Mental Health, which is edited by Chris, uh, a, a, an English psychiatrist called Chris Cook. And he, he, he goes into all of these kinds of, of issues. So the person asks that question, if they want, if they're thinking about the, that breath, then some, a, a resource like that would be very, very helpful there. But I, I would say that something like, um, you know, when Paul talks about nothing being able to separate you from the love of God, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's a good place to begin to talk about the alienation that people feel uh, in relation to, to um, uh, the particular experiences they have. For something like PTSD, the Psalms of Lamentation are, are a very good place because that gives you a space to articulate the, the hurt and the brokenness that you, you, your experiences. The, um, also, strangely enough, and the, the people don't really know what to do very often with the Psalms of Imprecation. You know, these, the, kind of, the, the curse in Psalms, the Psalms are, 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 are really violent in the language that say things like, Lord, smash the Babylonian babies' heads off the rock, which is not something we normally raise our hands to, to do in, in the middle of worship, yet it comes as part of the liturgy. Um, now, the interesting thing about the, the imprecation is it's, it's about, it's, it's aimed at um, Christians, or at least Jewish people, I suppose, or Jewish Christians, uh, Jews and Christians, who have been betrayed within the church. So the language of the issues and the invocation for the most part, or very often, is a way of articulating the brokenness within the body of Christ. So if you have trauma that you've experienced from within the church, then the Psalms of Invocation are actually, uh, if, if you use them uh, carefully and sensitively, are a way of articulating the reality of the brokenness within the body of Christ and opening that space, which once you start to talk about it, opens up a possibility for healing. So there's lots of ways in which you can use scripture in that way. But that, I would suggest that book is a, is a, is a more kind of in-depth, uh, broader, uh, perspective. Thank you. Go ahead, Peggy. Um, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Swinton. This has been a, a fabulous presentation. Thanks, Jim, for arranging this too. I've been thinking about young people, adolescents, who um, in, in increasing numbers appear to be dealing with depression and anxiety. Uh, you know, the basic concepts you've talked about, walking alongside and listening, seem to be very relevant. But I wondered if you've seen or you're aware of other things that are of particular uh, importance to be aware of when we're dealing with uh, people with less life experience and uh, still struggling. Well, one thing that, that, that I think that we need to put some serious thought into is the way in which youngsters use social media. Um, now, there's, a, there's a couple of things in there. One, the first thing would be that uh, social media makes your friendships very thin. And so, you know, you, you, if, you, if you get into that kind of Facebook mentality where you befriend people and unfriend with a flick of a spit switch, actually over time, that's exactly the way that people will begin to behave. And it's, it's a number of studies that have shown that social media reduces your, your empathy. Uh, and I actually saw a study, a study the other day that says social media, if you using Google reduces your IQ, so be careful. <laughs> um, so I think having strategies within which we can engage with youngsters in this, in social media, but thicken the way that they, their conversations and help them to, to to match their real life relationships with the, the way that they're kind of hardwired, it's hardwired into uh, into um, thinking about in particular ways about relationships. But the, one of the big downsides of, of social media is the way in which anxiety, depression, and suicide are um, passed on. 
because I mean, I, I, if, it takes, if it takes the issue of, of suicide, which in, in our in our context here in Europe is a rising problem, particularly amongst young men, but, but more and more so within young women. And one of the things that you notice is that if, if for example, in a school, somebody commits suicide, uh, grief counsellors will be sent in, not just to deal with the grief, but to stop a culture of suicide emerging because once one person has done it it becomes an option that's that's one of the reasons why it runs in families because one person once it's done once it becomes an option it wasn't before the problem with social media is it's always an option because that narrative is always there likewise for depression likewise for self uh, uh, abuse likewise for a, a good deal of mental health health challenges so I think it's the responsibility of all of us as Christians to recognize the mental health issues that are kind of built into the way in which youngsters communicate in, in social media and begin to think about what that means in relation to real world uh, uh, relationships, which we're responsible for, because well, they're both real world, but they, 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 there's, a, there's a formative component in young people today that wasn't there 20 years ago or however long it would be. So learning that and being on top of that is important. John? Uh, hi, Rick. Hi. Um, Two-part question. Um, yeah, one is in reaction to one of the stories uh, with the uh, man with schizophrenia told a woman on the bus um, and she got off. Um, and that can be um, a uh, at times normal reaction that we have fears when we're, uh, yeah. you know, coming in interaction with somebody with, um, you know, significant mental health issues. And so how, how can we uh, as members of our church, um, uh, you know, be able to stay there and, and not run away from, um, but yeah. be with, you know, uh, anybody that is you know, sharing with us any of their mental health challenges. Um, and, and is there any programs you know within churches that um, you know, can help us be able to stay with and not uh, you know, run from? Um, yeah. Folks? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's two uh, initiatives that's, that's worth considering. The first one, I'm just thinking because you, you, you have Bob in your congregation, it's, 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 a, it's a possibility. Some churches in the UK have um, what they call it, bailing groups, which basically means that um, they're, they're pastoral care groups which contain both professionals and non-professional people. So you'll maybe have a psychiatrist, a psychologist, pastoral care, a minister, a lay person, whatever it is. And they meet fairly regularly to discuss particular case situations, or particular, not case, because that's a bit too medical, but situations within their congregation uh, around mental health in particular. And so these are places where you're learning about the, the, the clinical dimensions of mental health, along with the relational dimensions of mental health, uh, but always embodied within a situation within your own congregation. And so over time, people begin to break down some of these barriers and begin to learn how it is that we can be together. So that's one way in which you can, you can do that as an aspect of your pastoral care groups. If you have a you know, if you have a number of people in your congregation who have professional skills and a number of people who are experienced in it, bringing these, all these things together is great. The other thing I, I think, found recently, recently, I was speaking at a church in, uh, in Vancouver and they have a preaching team. And before any sermon is preached, it has to be preached to the preaching team. Uh, and so, and then the preach team gives feedback and then they, 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 they preach it on, on the Sunday. Um, but what they're looking at, de at developing or thinking about developing is incorporating people with uh, mental health challenges into that uh, discernment group. So that they, uh, the sermon is preached to the group and then the feedback that comes back will include the experience of people with disabilities or experience of people with mental health challenges. Uh, and that way, when a sermon is preached, then uh, it's, in principle, it should preach to the whole people. Over time, sermons should preach to the whole people. And that way you, you raise the educational level in, in, the, in the congregation or awareness levels maybe, through 
the preaching and teaching, which is where actually many people get most of their learning from. So th these two initiatives are probably uh, fairly straightforward, but useful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Swinton, for being with us this morning. If we could all give him a digital round of applause. That was incredible. That was really helpful. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's been nice to talk to you all. Yes, we received word just this week that we are officially designated as a wise congregation in the United Church of Christ. Um, but even though we have that designation, there's still work that we need to do. Um, that's the whole point of receiving the designation. So that's thank you great. for helping us guide the, the future of our ministry. We really appreciate your time, and yeah. we'll see everyone in worship in just a few minutes. All right. Good to meet you all. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Bye. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, John. Oh, he left. And thank you, Jim, for getting John for us. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning. So good. You're welcome. I'm thank glad you, you enjoyed thank it. You. He's he's yes. quite he's quite wonderful. He is yeah. amazing. Very eloquent and thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Yes, very excellent.